All right, grace and peace, everyone. Thanks for joining tonight's Bible study. Um, I hope everyone had a wonderful and blessed day in the Lord today. You know, I appreciate you all for joining, for taking the time out. Um, basically, you know, learning the Bible, the, you know, the scriptures, the different books, epistles. And, you know, in this Bible study, we can also edify each other as well. So tonight, we're going to continue the book of Romans. Romans chapter 2, we'll be touching on tonight. And time permitting, we may touch on chapter 3. So I'm going to open us up in prayer at this time. And I just wanted to ask if anyone currently does not have their mics on mute, if you can please mute them at this time. All right, just gonna check a few things. All right, so I'm gonna open us up in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you now in the name of Jesus Christ, and we give you thanks, O Lord God, once again for another day, O Lord, for waking us up this morning. We thank you for your grace and your continual strength, O Lord God, that you give to us. Help us, O Lord God, to continue to grow more in understanding of your word, to grow more in the truth, O Lord God, to grow more in heavenly virtues, O Lord, as we continue to seek your face, O Lord God, as we continue to make an effort to study your word. O Lord God Almighty, direct our steps, O Lord God Almighty. Help us to be obedient, O Lord God. For your word is a light to our path and a lamp to our feet, O Lord God, as it is written. Wherefore, strengthen each and every one of us, O Lord God. Keep us and protect us, O God, from the schemes of the enemy, O Lord God. Cover this Bible study line, even now in the name of Jesus Christ, O Lord God, from any demonic attacks. And let your will be done in our lives, O God. Have your way, O Lord God, in our lives. Strengthen me to conduct it, O Lord God Almighty, and continue, O Lord God, to purify our hearts. Anything you see in us, O Lord God, that's not pleasing to you, O God, reveal it to us so we may repent from it. In the name of Jesus Christ, we give you thanks and we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Amen. All right, so we're going to start Romans chapter two now so if you remember from um, last bible study which was tuesday we talked on romans chapter one in which paul was you know addressing many things concerning the the heathen you know as as he mentioned as you know people they cover up the truth they refuse to acknowledge god you know god basically you know gives them over to reprobate mind to do the base things, you know, and he mentioned a lot of different sins, basically the broad pathway. In this chapter, Paul is now going to basically talk about the legalists, the Judaizers, the legalists in this chapter, in which um, he goes to confront their, you know, their hypocrisy, basically, as we're, we're gonna see as we dive into this chapter. So last chapter, Paul was more discussing about the pagans, the heathens and their sinful behaviors. While in this chapter, he is now going to tackle on the legalist. So Romans chapter 2, verse 1, I'm going to be using the New King James Version. And if you have your Bibles, you know, you can follow along any version you choose. All right, so it reads, Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge, for whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. So as you notice, he said, therefore, because it's a continuation from the last chapter. I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with this, but just a brief overview. When Paul wrote these letters, originally, they were not divided in chapters. It was just one um, continuous flow. It was actually just one letter. And Back in early um, Christianity, there was um, an archbishop that actually began to um, divide the letters in chapter and different chapters and verses. So just to let you know, it's a continuation. Basically, it's one continuous flow, one letter that he wrote to the, um, the church at Rome. And now he's beginning to speak on, as I mentioned, the legalists who 
are basically judging the heathens, you know, for their actions, but yet they they um, partake of those same exact actions. Verse two, but we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this old man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? So as Paul is explaining, it is foolish for you know, the self-righteous, basically legalists who condemn others to um, actually think that God will only judge the heathen and not them, especially if they practice these things. You know, we see this going around even today in Christendom, you know, hypocrisy. And, you know, as you remember Jesus, when he came on the scene, he even spoke of something about um, judge not lest you be judged, you know, condemn not lest you be condemned. And he talks about, you see a speck in your brother's eye, but yet there's a, there's a, a beam alive in your own eye. And he said, hypocrites, cast out that beam out of your own eye first, and then you'll see clearly to take that speck out your brother's eye. This is basically what's going on here as Paul is confronting these legalists, Judaizers, you know, who are basically engaging in, you know, sin. They're not living a pure life, but yet they're condemning the heathen. And Paul is making it known that don't think that they'll escape God's judgment. You know, God is not only going to judge the heathen, but he's going to judge them as well. If they do those simple things, then they'll be judged for those simple things as well. Verse four, or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Now, I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with the term forbearance, but what it means is a willingness to tolerate. You see, God's goodness and his mercy, he's long suffering towards us, towards people in, in general. You know, the Bible tells us that all men, you know, were born in sin. You know, we all fall short of the glory of God. You know, it's because of God's, you know, mercy. Why we were given the chance, the grace to come to repentance, to come to the knowledge of the truth. And this is what Paul is saying here. You know, it's because of his forbearance, his goodness that actually leads you to repentance. Wherefore, because God is merciful on us, right? He's telling the legalists they shouldn't be condemning others as well. We should never have that mentality, you know, because when we condemn others, you know, we're not basically showing mercy to them to give them a chance so they can repent, but rather we should exhibit that same long suffering, that same mercy upon them as God exhibited upon us. Because when we begin to condemn, not give them a chance, you basically are despising God's goodness. You're, you, be, you begin to despise his long suffering towards them. You know, that's what happens when you can, if you um, condemn them. In regards to us, our personal lives now, when a person, you know, willfully um, does not respond to the grace of God, you know, to turn and repent, you know, God is showing them signals, giving them hits, you know, whether he's sending a minister to witness to them, but they refuse. They themselves, they're actually despising God's goodness and his forbearance and his long suffering. They're despising, you know, God is merciful, you know, towards people. There's always a time of mercy, an open door, you know, for people, for people to come to repentance. But the time comes when that door is shut. The time comes where there will be no more mercy. As the saying goes, once mercy runs its course, then judgment comes. And he goes on to say in verse five, but in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. There he goes. That's the, the righteous judgment of God. Anytime you despise God's forbearance, you know, you begin to stir up wrath. It's basically you're, you're piling up wrath. You're piling up sin upon yourself because there's a day, as we all know, that's coming that God is going to judge. He's going to judge the world, you know, and he's going to render to everyone 
according to his works. God's long suffering. What long suffering is basically? It's patience which forgives until there is no more hope of repentance. And that's how God is. You know, patience given to you until there is no more hope of repentance. All right. Jesus, you know, talked about uh, forgiving our brother 70 times, seven times, you know, and he also mentioned to be as merciful as the father is merciful in heaven. This is what, you know, God requires of us as well, you know, to be patient and long suffering towards people, towards our brothers and sisters in Christ. And Paul is tackling the legalists who lack this patience, the, um, who have a religious spirit, basically, because they're not patient with people. They're, they're condemning the heathen, but yet they are practicing these very same things. You know, God's patience, his forbearance, it leads people to repentance. But as, as it's mentioned, when we continue to despise this grace, you know, you end up storing up wrath for the day of wrath. All right. Verse seven. Verse six, sorry. Who will render to each one according to his deeds? All right. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. All right, so what is this telling us here? You know, basically, those who are obedient to the faith, those who are obedient to the faith, you know, by patient continuance, they seek for glory, honor, and immortality. You know, that's basically, that's going to be the reward for those who are patient, uh, patient in the faith, who will endure to the end, who continue to obey the word of God, who continue to submit themselves to God, to do the will of the Father in heaven. You know, but verse eight says, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, all right? Indignation and wrath. Let's continue, verse nine. Tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also of the Greek, but glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality to God, with God. God shows no favoritism, whether in condemning or whether in salvation, granting salvation. God doesn't show no favoritism, no partiality. You know, those who, who um, obey the truth, they'll be rewarded for, for good, you know, for obeying the faith, obeying the gospel. Glory, honor, immortality, you'll have treasures in heaven, rewards in heaven. But those who refuse and choose to obey unrighteousness, as he mentioned, there's going to be indignation, which basically, um, the word for that basically means hot anger, basically wrath. Tribulation, which is basically affliction. And anguish, which is distress. And that comes upon every soul that does evil. You know, basically you reap what you sow. You know, but those who are doing good, glory, honor, and peace. As to the Jew first, and then to the Gentile, you know. So you have to look at it this way. Bible says, you know, judgment starts in the house of God. You know, if God's people are living in sin. They're disobeying him. It happens to them first. And then if the, the, the Gentiles, the heathens, they live in it in sin. It happens to them next because God doesn't show any partiality. He's going to reward everyone according to their works, whether it be good or evil. So Paul is letting the legalists know that not, they should not think that they're able to escape God's judgment if they continue to behave this way. That's what he's basically touching on. All right. So now we're going into verse 12 and it reads, for as many as have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. Verse 13. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. So what is Paul talking about here? The doers of the law will be justified. Okay, let's continue. We're going to further understand. For when Gentiles who do not have the law 
by nature do the things in the law. That's the clue, right? These, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts. Their conscience also bring witness, and between themselves, their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. All right? So Paul is not, he's not talking about the, the Mosaic ordinance. The, um, I believe it's 613 or 615. Um, commandments in the Mosaic ordinances. No, but rather he's talking about the royal law of liberty, which is actually written in James chapter one, verses 22 to 25. Um, basically, you know, the, the word, I'm just going to read it real quick. No one has to turn there, but I'm going to read it real quick so we can just get a better understanding of what he's talking about. So James chapter one, starting at verse 22, it says, be, but be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. All right, so listen. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continue, continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So that is what uh, Paul is talking about when we harmonize the scripture, the royal law of liberty, basically. Um, the word, law written in your hearts. And Paul stated that if the Gentiles, right, are basically obeying this law of liberty in their hearts, doing what is right, right, then it bears witness that they are a law to themselves. Their own conscience ac accusing them or, or excusing them, you know, telling them what, what they did was right or telling them what they did was bad. You know, There's, we all have a conscience. Everybody has a conscience, right? And what does this show us now based on what Paul is telling us? There's not gonna be, there's not gonna be any excuse for anyone. Because as, as, he writ, as he wrote in verse 12, for as many as have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. What does this tell us about God? God has not left the world without a sufficient, sufficient amount of light within people's. He hasn't left the world without a sufficient amount of light. Everyone is born with a conscience, you know? And Paul was using the example, like the Gentiles, right? They don't even have the law from God but yet they're doing what is in that law, the law of liberty. It shows that it's written in their conscience. So no one is actually gonna have an excuse without God. Whoever perishes without the law, they're gonna perish without it because they have a conscience. And if you sin in the law, you're gonna be judged by it. All right, let's continue. Verses um, 16, in the day when God will judge the secrets of men, by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. So he's basically talking about the day of judgment, how God will bring everything to light, both to Jew and to Gentile. Verses 17. Indeed, all right, you are called a Jew and rest on the law and make your boast in God and know his will. Okay, so now he's speaking to them, writing to them now. And approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of days, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? All right, so this is where he now begins to um, tackle on the hypocrisy of the legalist, basically. Continue. You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? Or in other words, sacrilege. You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking of the law? This, this is basically hypocrisy. This is what Paul is tackling on. Is that there were legalists, you know, Jews, as I mentioned before, were condemning heathens of what they were doing, right? And they were given the law. They were given a higher responsibility to um, declare God's goodness, declare God's um, faithfulness, his ways based on the law. 
but they themselves were not obeying. This was hypocrisy. Jesus also spoke on this when he challenged the religious leaders, when he came on the scene. And this shows us, you know, God holds us at a higher, higher um, level of accountability, a higher standard. You see, we as um, believers in Christ, you know, we, we were given the word of God. We know the gospel of Jesus Christ. We know a way we're supposed to live, how we're supposed to walk in this world. So we're expected to um, be a light to this dark world. You know, many people, there's this saying that many people say, I'm not sure if anyone heard it. And it goes like this. The, the world is in the condition it is today. And it's because the church is not shining its light. You see, like the church is supposed to reflect the light of Christ. But sad to say that many churches, you know, have allowed the world and its ways to infiltrate it, to infiltrate it. There is much hypocrisy, you know. Praise God one day, but behave like the world another day. But yet, you know, condemn others how they're living, but yet they're living in the same exact way, you know. And that's, that's the sad condition that we have in Christendom today. You know, very, very sad. We're called to be a light. You know, as the Jews, we're also given a responsibility as well. You know, to them was given the oracles of God, you know, but they also displayed hypocrisy. Nothing is new underneath the sun. The religious system back then displayed her hypocrisy, and the religious system today is displaying hypocrisy. And God is going to bring everything into an account. You see? So Paul is discussing this with the legalists as he's writing this letter that they're, they're teaching this. They're supposed to be guides to the blind, you know, but they're not teaching themselves. They're not teaching themselves how they're supposed to behave. All right, let us continue. For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So now he's tackling on circumcision, which was a part of the Mosaic ordinances now. It was first given to the patriarch Abraham, and it got also included in the law of Moses. All right. And during the times of the early church, when the church was born, there were um, heresies, certain doctrines that were being introduced into the church, which is written in Acts, in Acts 15, I believe it is, stating that they believe the Gentiles should be circumcised in order to be saved. You know, so there was a lot of Judaizers, legalists, who were going out there teaching that they should circumcise you know, the Gentiles. And they believed by doing this, they were made right with God. And Paul here is discussing that, listen, if you circumcise yourself, right, and you don't keep the law, then that doesn't profit you anything. Let's, let's read this again, verse 25. For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision, basically in the eyes of God. It's basically uncircumcision. It doesn't profit you anything. Verse 26. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the requirements, the righteous requirements of the law, remember it's law of liberty now, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? So he's asking the question, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? Verse 27, and will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you who, even with your written code and circumcision, are a transgressor of the law? So he's basically quite asking them a question, you know, how God sees things. Do they actually believe that with them behaving a certain way, contrary to God's way, contrary to God's law, law of liberty, if they go and circumcise themselves, do they really believe that that's counted as being circumcised? No, it's not. Verse, verse um, 28, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly. Now he reveals a mystery. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, meaning naturally. Nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, okay? But he is a Jew who is one 
inwardly. That means in the spirit, according to the spirit, right? And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from man, but from God. So Paul now revealed a mystery to them, how God views things. That circumcision is not based on the outward, not based on the flesh. And a Jew is not based on the flesh outwardly, but one is a true Jew inwardly, one who truly walks with God, one who truly obeys God, the royal, um, the, the royal law of liberty, obeying the word. And circumcision is of the spirit. There's a verse in the scripture that talks about we have been circumcised in Christ. Our hearts have been circumcised, putting away the body of sins of the flesh. Circumcision is of the heart and the spirit. And this is what Paul is touching on. That's the true circumcision. That's the true Jew. You know, he mentions how the Jews, they blaspheme God's name among the Gentiles. Now, what does that mean? Blaspheme basically it means, you know, defamation or evil, you know, spoken of. Based on how the Jews were behaving, their character, walking in hypocrisy, they end up blaspheming God. And, you know, many, you know, many Christians, you know, do that today. Anytime you take upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, you're expected, quote unquote, to wear it a certain way. You're expected to live a certain lifestyle. Why? Because we're called to a higher standard. And we're called to a higher level of accountability. We're called to be a light. But when we live in a way contrary to God's ways, contrary to his word, the royal law of liberty. In our actions, we blaspheme him among the nations. We blaspheme him among unbelievers, you know, which is very, it, it's critical. It's bad. It's bad. And that was also going on in Paul's days as well with the legalists, with Judaizers, blaspheming God's name. And even before Paul as well. Because he quoted a verse from the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 52, verse 5, where you know he speaks on God's people blaspheming his name throughout the years, throughout the decades, throughout the centuries. You know, they were not living right. When Christ came on the scene, they were not living right. And Christ, you know, confronted them, you know, confronted their hypocrisy. You know, they were like whitewashed tombs he used, you know, they appeared outwardly righteousness. But their hearts were unclean, filled with extortion, filled with sin, filled with hypocrisy. And that is what God looks at. He looks at the spirit, the heart. So Paul goes to explain all this to the legalists in this chapter. And this actually con concludes Romans chapter 2 today. So as we see the difference between chapter 1 where he goes to speak on the, as I mentioned, the heathen, the pagan how they were living the simple lifestyle. They did not want to you know, retain God in their knowledge. They wanted to suppress the truth. So they ended up giving over to reprobate minds. And in this chapter, Paul now is touching on the legalists, their behavior, how they are condemning you know, these pagans because of their lifestyle. However, they themselves are not even living right before God. And they're actually called to be the teachers. They're called to be the example. So they're displaying a form of hypocrisy. And this is what was mentioned in Romans chapter two. So now I'm going to um, you know, leave room for um, discussion, you know, questions, insight. Um, anyone have any you know, questions or anything they want to share um, before I ask a question, um, you can feel free to go ahead now and mute your mics. Go ahead. All right, if, um, if no one have anything to share, I'm gonna ask a question then. Okay, um, my question for this chapter is, give me, a, give me an example. Um, what does it look like? What does it mean to pass judgment on someone? Um, I think a good way of, or an example of passing judgment on somebody is not coming at them hostily and saying, oh, you're doing this, so you're going to go to hell for it. It's more of like a 
like, hey, I kind of noticed that you're kind of messing up in this area. And I'm telling you out of love that you got to do better. You know what I mean? It's kind of a rough answer. I'm currently kind of sick, but that's that's what I got. <laughs> Okay, that's that's a that's that's a good that's a good answer. Basically, um, what you were mentioning, what you stated, two ways to approach. Well, one way to approach it, basically, um, passing judgment, you know, you know, condemning others, which is good. But rather, what you were mentioning is, um, you know, correcting your brethren in love. Basically, is how we should approach it. If I understood understood correctly, that's a it's a good answer. Good answer. Anyone else like to um tackle on the question? Question is, what does it mean to pass judgment? Um, give me an example. Well, without, um, I'll just say this um, to tag on to that. So, without a collection of information as to what, um, if it's a situation, the situation was about, or to, with, uh, without obtaining the necessary information needed, vital information pertaining to what happened or pertaining to the situation, but um, um, but, but so without that, so then just um, going forward to, to, to tell the individual or to, to just name it, you know what I mean? So without getting the enough of information needed to um, intelligently, to intelligently um, speak on it, you just say what, is on your mind and not really, it's not thought out. It's not thought out. Um, and uh, that's passing judgment. Because if I, if I don't, if I don't have the information necessary, um, if the situation happened and I have not gathered um, both sides of, uh, of the, um, both sides of the story or whatnot, I'll just say it like that. Um, but I just go in and just off of my emotion, go forward and, and call it what I feel that it is without gathering the necessary information that I'm passing judgment because it may not be what I thought it is, what I'm thinking. It may be something, a missing piece. So this is what, that's my answer to that question. Okay, excellent, excellent answer. Basically, you know, not having enough information, enough evidence, basically. Um, so because of that, you just make a, a judgment, basically an unrighteous judgment. It could be like a wrong, a wrong decision, basically, that you make um, based on in, insufficient um, evidence or information. Yes. Excellent answer. Anyone else like to um, tackle on the question? I do. I just want to pick you up on what um, Fanta Drama said. And basically, both answers, good answers for Zach and, and uh, my sister. Um, but I, I was going to reiterate and say, as well as just not knowing, um, putting yourself in that person's shoes or situation. Like if you were to place your, yourself in that situation or their shoes for those particular circumstances, um, it, you won't have that same thought process about yourself. So I feel like it just, it's a lack of, um, compassion, a lack of, of course, love for your sister or brother and just not knowing because you don't know, you don't know the whole story. You don't know what they've been through. You don't know why they thought or act in the way they do act. And so instead of guiding them and leading them in the way you feel like, um, you know, you know, it should be, or it should go in a loving way and in a compassionate way without being prideful, um, you just pass judgment. And so I, I, I just want to say that that's, that's my, my opinion on it. Yes. That's also a great answer. Yes, definitely. Um, because they may not understand what a person actually going through because they've never been in their shoes. You know, they'll just judge the situation and judge the individual, uh, based on what they see, based on what they perceive and they'll lack compassion because they truly don't have an understanding. That is why, you know, there's a saying that says you truly do not know what someone is going through unless you've actually been in their shoes. So that's an excellent answer, you know, and that teaches us not to um, judge by outward appearances. Okay. Um, like to, yep. Yes. 
what do I do if you say something about it and that person lashes out on you? So that's what I want to know. Well, the person, you know, you maintain your peace. You maintain your peace, you know. Um, you you always maintain your peace. You don't lash back, you know, because the word of God tells the harsh words you know, stir up strife. So whether you try to consent, correct someone in gentleness, you know, if they refuse, you know, correction, all right, just maintain your peace, you know. And by wisdom, it'll teach you how to approach um, the individual maybe at a better time, you know, because perhaps, you know, people lash out because sometimes they don't really want to hear anything at that particular moment, you know, whatever emotions they're experiencing. But that's the first thing you do. You maintain your peace, you know. Don't allow um, them lashing out their anger um, cause you to react in a certain way. If you're trying to correct them in gentleness, you know, putting them back on the path and they lash out, okay, all right, you maintain your peace. You just wait to a better time to approach the situation. That's what I would say. Um, I have a question also. Um, so if it's a situation where it's something that you recognize that somebody else um, is doing something that you're also like working on and you go and um, you're not necessarily judging them. You just notice that they're making the same mistake that you are currently making. And you go and you try to correct them. Is that like, not in like a mean and nasty way, like, hey, like you're doing this wrong, but like, you know how everybody is saying, like, you know, just kind of like correcting them and trying to help them back on like the track is that like a form of like judgment and hypocrisy like even because like I mean like you're struggling with it also so you're in the wrong too but you're telling somebody else that they're wrong does that make sense yeah technically yeah that is a form of hypocrisy you know um you're basically if you're actually engaged in the same thing you know, they're, they're doing, you know, the whole thing is you have to correct yourself first, you know, um, correct yourself as Jesus, as Jesus has stated, right? Um, you know, you see a speck in your brother's eye, but yet there's a beam in your own eye, you know, you, you, you tell your brother, you know, hey, let me take that speck out your, your, your eye, but yet you don't see that beam in your own eye, you know, first cast out that beam in your eye first, and then you'll see clearly enough cast out that speck out your brother's eye. You know, this is also what Paul was discussing with the legalists as well, you know. They're, you know, con condemning other people for what they're doing, but yet they're doing the exact same thing. So yeah, it's best to, you know, correct yourself first in that area, you know, and then you can properly correct somebody else in that same area you once struggled in. So the best advice would just to stay silent until you've, became better yourself because like even if so like even if even if you're working on making that part better you should just stay silent until you've completely you know God has completely like you know uh, taken those things out of your what's up oh dang uh, excuse me can, can I touch on that real quick I know I came in a little late um, how you doing okay uh, uh yeah yeah hey sister yeah I, I'll say um I, I'm not gonna say stay silent, like you know what I'm saying, because we we not supposed to fight our bat battles alone and behind closed doors silently. You know, I understand if we're trying to get delivered for something specifically, and maybe if we want to keep that between us and God. But if you struggling with something, you battling with it, but you know, God is you know God is with you through it, and you know what I'm saying you you on your way to deliverance. I believe it's good to open up your mouth and communicate that. To, a, to one of your sisters or one of another of your sisters or your brothers and let them know what you're dealing with but how God is maybe guiding you through it and maybe you can get them some steps and everything like that. And then um, when you overcome it and when you do get delivered from whatever you're battling, when you do correct them, it, it's really going to be in love. It's, it's not going to be no type of condemnation attached to it. You know, it might convict them, but if anything, when you overcome it, you actually gonna correct them in a more edifying and loving way instead of a, you know, seem like a judgment or you being harsh on them. You feel me? So that's that's what I'll say, sister. 
Excellent answer. Excellent answer. So yeah, basically, if you're going through it, right, rather than, you know, correct them, you guys encourage each other to it. You know, you share, you know, what you're going through as well. You help build each other up. When you're, when you're completely delivered from that, you know, then you can correct them in love, correct them in love. But to actually correct them while you're going through the same thing, you know, the exact same thing or, you know, passing judgment, whatever, you know, it will display a form of hypocrisy, you know. So in that current situation, you know, you, you encourage each other to get through that struggle. You know, sometimes um, people have what's known as accountability partners, you know. So you encourage each other to get through that struggle you know, until you like, you know, overcome it by the grace of God. All right. Anyone else um, have anything they want to share? Or like to tackle on the question? Oh, yeah. Um, I'll share something. Um, yeah. I definitely do agree. Um, I feel like sometimes, like, when I look at somebody's situation, I'd be like, oh, it's not my place to, like, judge them or be like, um, you know, like, how come, like, they're not trying to get out the situation? And for me, it just it takes a lot of self-reflecting and just looking at yourself and knowing that, you know, we all are, you know, flawed in some type of way. And we all come from certain backgrounds that could, you know, put us in certain situations. And so for me, like, I'm all about just, you know, trying to encourage the person and not, you know, come from a place of judgment, but from a place of love and just encourage them and be like, you know, like whatever they, you know, whatever situation that they're in is temporary. And if they just, you know, pretty much live through life, like how I live it, just, you know, stay in faith and believe in myself and not let my past be my future. And that's the only way I could do it to just, you know, encourage somebody, but not judge them. So. Great answer. And I like the term you use, self-reflection. Self-reflection, very, very important. You know, look at look at ourselves first. You know, look at our own struggles first. Look at our own weaknesses. You know, before we start to um critique or criticize others and stuff. Self-reflection. I like that. Excellent answer. Yeah, that was a beautiful. Anyone else? I did want to touch on uh, just what she said. That that is a beautiful yep. answer. Um, you know. Just you know, just as far as um, and I believe you know, and back in the you know, back in the biblical old days when they used to get judged, they used to actually get stoned or they used to get a harsh judgment. But like a, a lot of us, I think we, we we mistake judgment a lot of times, you know, because some somebody can probably just be criticizing us in a, in a good way. And sometimes we probably don't know how to take that criticism or, you know, um, and then and then it says the spirit judges rightly anyway. So when you walk in by the spirit and you walk in love, you know, it's, it's if anything, your judgment is going to be righteously, you know, judged and everything like that. But I understand I had to learn myself because I remember when I was just, you know, when you overcome certain things and then you overcome certain things in this walk that you was battling with once and you you, you stronger. And when, when you see somebody else battling with it, you 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 it, it's kind of you you doing it. And I, I had to catch myself because it's like. You know, I'm passionately edifying them and everything like that, but I'm I'm I I I don't want them to basically to you feel me indulge in it the way I did. So I'm like I'm so super passionate to the word of point. It's like you know, it's like I it, like, it seemed like I was kind of coming off you know kind of harsh as far as just like, but I had to I had to remember I had to think and like, God is patient. God was patient with me. You know what I'm saying? Like, and everybody got their own pace and God is having us go through our own process. So like, I have to be patient. Like, he, he who, you know, this is another brother in Christ too that's fighting. You know what I'm saying? And, and God had to be patient with me. So I, I, I'm going to be patient with him or whoever else, you know? Like, so I had to catch myself a minute ago too about that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. Martha, can you say it really made me think like if God is being patient, extremely patient with with us. Why can't we be patient with him? Oh, that's a good question. You said why we can't be patient. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> she said why. Wow. You said God. If God, if 
God is so patient with us, why we can't be patient with him? Wow, that's a great question, sister. Wow. Well, I want to answer that. I was like, about to say, I got a response, but go ahead, Eli. Oh, no, no, no. No, please, man. I appreciate it. just real quick. Um, just a simple answer, Carrie. Um, a lot of times we react out of flesh, and flesh is not willing, but spirit is. So if we if we continue to walk and allow um the Holy Spirit to lead us and, and listen out, we, we would have that same patience. Probably not as as patient as God is with us, but a lot more than our flesh leads us to be. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, alive, you want to go? I want to answer something real quick. I don't want to go before you alive if you're trying to. Oh, no, I can listen. I, I just want to answer something real quick, you know, because it's, I want to piggyback off what Paige just said, because this is a, this this is serious. It's a spiritual warfare that we in, you know, when we see people, you're right, going through, that we've gone through that before. We see people going down that road and it's like, my God, you know, you, 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 you're talking to them, you know, but we have to, what we have to do is jog back our memory and say, you know what, when I was going through that, when I was experiencing that, you know, um, that, that I listened <laughs> off the first, off the flip, no, this, I had, it was a process of getting through before I asked, and what I realized once I got to the point to where I came out of that the, those uh those situations you know i mean and i and i you know we hey I, we all fall i make sure that i'm i'm not saying i've arrived lord knows i haven't but i'm i'm further than i was back then right we can all say okay i don't do that anymore i don't have a desire to do that so there's always something then you know but what i'm saying i was about to say is that um i, I remember that um that the, there were intercessors sometimes you just you talked and you talked and you're like you know what I, I need, let me just intercede for this person to have because sometimes they won't be able to hear and to, to hear you. you they cannot hear you and have understanding because they're not there sometimes it's just pray for them pray for them no matter what you say what you say they may not be able to hear this just falls on the deaf ears because it's not quite the time, but the, it can be shortened through prayer and fasting and through intercession. Um, I wanted to just uh, insert that because there's certain that I, I mean, I remember, you know, seeing people, my loved ones going through certain things. And I know I've been through that before. Let me tell you about this baby girl. Let me let you know that this is not the way you want to go. Cause I've been there and done it. But if they're not hearing, you have to go to the throne. You, you have to go before the most high Yah, his feet and just lay it there and continue to stay there and just fight the war, the spiritual warfare that it is right in spirit and allow the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit to have his way because there's no other way that they can hear. But the in spirit, there can be a, a door, a, a, a something broken, a levy broken and in spirit, it can be an opening that then can um, allow the the, uh, the the breakthrough to happen in the spirit because you got, you know, you 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 praying for angels to come before, you know, you you going hardcore, especially if you you put a fast with it, then it's really, then you really going in before the, you know, for the most high God. And then therefore, you know, you have to take it before the throne. You have to take it before, um, you know, because the, the judge is the father. So take it before. This is a spiritual warfare and spiritual realm is much more realer than this realm that we in right now is it's much more realer. So I'm just wanted to insert that. Thank you a lot for allowing me to, to go before you. So. Oh, no, no problem. Oh, well, I'm going to say it was really quickly. It was just like Paige, right? It's always our first we desire, right? Because sometimes in our lives, um, before we were with Christ, right? We had we had a gimme, gimme, gimme mentality, right? But then when the spirit comes in, we have the, um, we always have patience. Um, we, then the spirit inserts patience into us. But that patience also needs to grow because you're not going to be patient like the Lord first. You're not going to be close to um, his patience, right? So it's a development, right? So you always have to make sure that you remember 
that you're developing, right? God is make is developing you as you go. So that means self-control, fruits of the spirits. You have to remember that it's all developing. So every so every time you think of that, you have to remember you're developing. Don't always try and use it as an excuse. Though. But yes, you are developing. You are gonna go through those certain times. You are gonna still sometimes have that gimme, gimme, gimme mentality. Just remember. The most high has your back. He gave you your Holy Spirit. So that self-control, that patience, it comes with it comes with it. That's that's all I gotta say. Thank you. And and if I could just tag on to where Live just said, I love that. I loved all the responses. Um, and I hope you you get some type of clarity from these answers, Carrie as well as if you consecrate yourself within the Lord and in his word, you will you will be reborn again. You will be a different creature. You would um, start to not allow yourself to be within flesh and, and live within flesh and allow flesh to make the decision. So that right there will lead you and allow you to be led by spirit, staying consecrated in your word and and just laying your burdens down. Because if you know the things that you're struggling with and the things that, that are kind of flesh led instead of spirit led um you will lay those burdens down at at, at the lord's feet and and allow him to or just even ask for the the discernment and the understanding and knowledge and wisdom um to even if you don't know like lord what is it that that i need to i need your help with allowing me to not live in in my old self my old ways you know because i'm trying to grow within you and he will definitely direct you and lead you and even help you um get rid of those things you know but it's yeah that's all i want to say thank you very much this is comforting i actually want to touch on that too i want to add to that just what sister was saying she was saying um she would just when she just brought up the old nature and serving the flesh and everything. Hold on one second. I got something to actually back that up. Hold on. Um, uh, hmm. Okay. Okay. Um. Okay. Okay. Hold on one second, please. Bear with me. Um. No problem. Hold on. Okay. Uh. For you to not receive a spirit of slavery. Hold on. I'm, I'm getting there. Hold on one second, because y'all saying some great. Okay. Um. I got a Bible verse right here. It say, um, it says, and this is in Romans. This is in Romans. Um, I was, I, I'm actually, I was in Romans today, and it, it actually, man, it, it was hard for me to take my eyes and get get my eyes out of that book. But it say, okay, for the mind, it say, for the mind controlled by the old nature is hostile to God because it does not submit itself to God's Torah. Indeed, it cannot. Thus, those who identify with their old nature cannot please God. That's Romans 8, 7 through 8. And check this out as well. It say, but you, you do not identify with your old nature, but with the spirit, provided the spirit of God is living inside of you. For anyone who doesn't have the spirit of the Messiah does not belong to him. However, if the Messiah is in you, then on the one hand, the body is dead because of sin. But on the other hand, the spirit is given life because God considers you righteous. And that's Romans 8, 9 through 10. God considers us righteous through Christ. That's the only way he is considering and us righteous is through the spirit of Christ. If we are appearing as his son, as we live in holy, as we be in a representation. Okay. And I got some more to say. And if the spirit of the one who raised Yeshua from the dead is living in you, then the one who raised the Messiah Yeshua from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit living in you. So this is saying when we walking by the spirit and not by the flesh, God will add life to our mortal bodies, to this, to the temple that God placed us in. You know, like he will add more life, more years to it, more health and wealth to, to our bodies when we walking by the spirit and not by the flesh. And then, um, okay, boom, that was Romans 8 and 11. This is for if for if you live according to your old nature, you will certainly die. 
but if by the spirit you keep put into death the practices of the body you will live so that's what constant that's what the sister was saying what she said consecrating yourself we got to consecrate ourselves daily consecrate our flesh putting away our selfish desires that would that would just that's only going to temporarily try to you know, satisfy the flesh and all it's gonna do is gonna the flesh is gonna keep begging and begging for more. It's never satisfied. That's why that's why the words say walk by the spirit and not by the flesh, because the spirit is willing. Walk by the walk by faith and not by by sight, because you can disbelief and everything you can what you see, you can you can you know you can highly determine of what's gonna be your outcome. But what you don't see, you believe in the, in the unknown, you believe in that, hey, in the unseen, you you have an everlasting faith in that, you know, and, and without faith, it's impossible to please God anyway. Mm. Okay, so I got that, and and then I, I'm, I'm going to read this last one. Um, okay, let's say, for you, do, for you did not receive a spirit of slavery to bring you back into fear. On the contrary, you receive the spirit who makes us sons and by whose power we cry out, Abba, that is dear father. The spirit himself bears witness with our own spirits that we are children of God. And if we, and, and if we are children, then we are also hearers, hearers. And if we are and, and, um, hearers of God and joint hearers with the Messiah, provided we are suffering with him in order also to be glorified with him. It says the that was uh Romans, that was Romans 8, um 16 through 17. And and then it says, the creation waits eagerly for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was made subject to frustration, not with not willingly, but because of the one who subjected it, meaning God created the earth. He created Mother Earth for man to fulfill Mother Earth's purpose. They say, but it was, but it was given a reliable hope that it too would be set free from its bondage to decay and would enjoy the and, and would enjoy the freedom accompanying uh, accompanying uh the glory that God's children will have. Um and then to say we we know that until now the whole creation has been groaning as with the pains of childbirth. And not only it, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit grown inwardly as we continue waiting, waiting eagerly to be made sons. That is, have our whole bodies redeemed and set free. <laughs> it say it was in this, it was in this hope that we are saved. But if we see what we hope for, it is a hope after all. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we continue hoping for something we don't see, then we will still wait eagerly for it with perseverance. And I want to say that, and that's uh, Romans 8, 24 through 25. Amen. Amen, man. Thanks for that word of exhortation. <laughs> we have our one minute left. <laughs> but um, that was um, a good word of exhortation you just shared. Um. We have one minute left, so anyone have any um thing quick they want to share or um any insights or a question before we close out for tonight? I do. I just wanted to 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 thank thank any everybody for your the scriptures that you shared because I have been in a very um weak and sensitive situation. I've been lonely these days and thank you for these scriptures in Romans. They really I they really convict me to just never give up hope. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, Terry. Amen. Amen. Definitely continue to um press on, be encouraged, reach out to um anyone on the discord app i think you're on the discord app you know reach out to anyone even myself um you know like like you know we're all we're brethren in christ you know once you're born again you have the holy ghost we're we're a part of the body of christ and we're here to lift each other up in prayer to help each other you know press on because this walk is not easy but the grace of god is sufficient for us so it is now nine o'clock so unfortunately i have to um 
call this Bible study a close. Um, I thank everyone, you know, once again for actually joining tonight. Um, you know, you're all a blessing to me. And I'm glad we're able to edify each other, you know, to bring insights, to encourage each other. Um, so let us, you know, continue to keep each other in prayer. Um, and, you know, definitely each and every one of you, you have a blessed night in Jesus' name. We're going to close this out in prayer and I'm going to um, stop the recording. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for tonight's Bible study, O Lord God Almighty. Your name is continually glorified in this earth, O Lord God. You are good. Lord, just help us to continue to um, encourage each other brothers and sisters in Christ, O oh Lord God. Just continue to lead us, O oh God. Help us to bear fruit, O oh Lord God Almighty. Help us to be even more patient the next year, even more merciful the next year, O oh God, even more loving the next year, O oh Lord God. Help us to be better the next year than we are the prior year, O oh Lord God Almighty, as we continue to grow in measure in the virtues of heaven, O oh Lord God Almighty. Touch each and every one of us here. Watch over us throughout this night, O oh God, and help us to continue to abide in your son, Jesus Christ, who is our salvation, O oh Lord God Almighty. Have angels around our homes, around our bedsides, oh Lord God, even tonight. And let your name be glorified in all the earth, in our lives, oh Abba. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we give you thanks and we pray. Amen.